It's finally here. My new book, Microbe Science for Gardeners, Secrets to Better Plant Health. My copy just arrived here and I'm really excited about this book. Now you might think, well, I'm more interested in gardening, not microbes. But microbes are extremely important to plant growth. The more you learn about these guys, the easier gardening gets. What I'm going to do in this video is read chapter one of this book. That'll give you some good background information and it'll give you some secrets for growing better plants. The book is available from Amazon worldwide and it's also available directly from my publisher, New Society Publishing. And I'll put links to all of those in the description below. Let me first read some of the comments people have made about the book. Science guides me in everything I do with gardening. It all starts in the soil, but not without microbes. Yet understanding the complexities of the many ways they make soil better and plants healthier can seem overwhelming. Robert Pavlis's newest book, Microbe Science for Gardeners, beautifully breaks it down in his usual no-nonsense way. If you want to learn anything about the science of soil, what's in it, then this book will help you easily understand the vital role microbes play in bringing soil and everything growing in it to life. This is written by Joe Lamp. He's also the founder of JoeGardner.com and the Online Gardening Academy. I'd also like to read a short quote that I added in the front of the book. We know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. This was written by Leonardo da Vinci, and it was true then, and it's still true today. We talk a lot about soil and microbes, but really, we know very little about what really goes on under the soil. Chapter 1. What do you see when you look at the surface of a leaf? The surface is mostly smooth but it can have some bumps on it, and some leaves are quite hairy. The color is mostly green, although yellow and red can also occur on garden plants. You might even see an insect or two crawling across the leaf, but other than that, there's not much activity. Your perspective of that leaf is very wrong because you are using your macro eyes. They just don't see the details very well. If you look at the leaf with a microscope, you suddenly see a whole new world that is full of millions of organisms. Some are stationary and others are speeding along. Admittedly, speeding along at microscopic levels is actually quite slow. Not only do you see many individual organisms, but you also see many different types. Some, like viruses, are extremely small and can't even be seen with a light microscope. In contrast, others are relatively huge, multi-celled organisms. Even shapes vary a lot. You'll see spheres, long rods, undefined blobs. Some are whipping hair-like appendages around to help them motor along. The colors are fabulous. Some are clear with almost no coloration, but many have shades of blue, green, red, and violet. Their surfaces also vary a lot, and scientists use this texture to help identify them. It might seem like an idyllic environment, all natural and cozy, but it's anything but. Microbes are constantly fighting for food and space. Small ones are eaten by larger ones, who get eaten by even larger ones. These guys don't even fight fairly. Some use chemical weapons to destroy each other. This is one very complex society. And to be honest, scientists are just starting to understand it. The most common microbes are bacteria. And a gram of fresh leaf, the weight of a paperclip, may harbor as many as a hundred million of them. Let's dig a little deeper. Scrape off all of the surface microbes so that we can see the leaf clearly. Under a microscope, the surface is no longer smooth. It is mountainous with all kinds of valleys, cracks, and holes. These are perfect places for microbes to hide. If you look a little closer at the holes, you find some very large ones, the stomata. The plant uses these to absorb carbon dioxide and expel excess oxygen, water, and other gases. The microbes take full advantage of these and crawl right inside the leaf. Some spend their whole life 
inside. Once inside the plant, microbes can even enter plant cells. Some of these are very beneficial to plants who actually send out chemical signals to attract them. Others, like viruses, can be quite harmful. A leaf is covered in thousands of different microbes. Some are beneficial, some are neutral, and others are harmful pathogens. This book is all about microbes and their interaction with plants and each other. Why learn about microbes when you could be learning how to care for plants? Wouldn't that make you a better gardener? Perhaps, but one thing I have learned after gardening for many years is that learning about plants only takes you so far. There are just too many plants to study. I have learned that if you take the time to understand the underlying basis of nature, growing any plant becomes easy. Microbes are vital to plant growth. They help plants get nutrients from the soil and dead organic matter. They cover every square inch of the plant, including leaves, stems, flowers, fruits, and even the roots. Some are beneficial to plants. Others are pathogens ready to kill the plant. And many play a more neutral role. But even these neutral actors are critical for soil structure, soil nutrient levels, and plant health. Understanding the interaction between plants and microbes is as important as learning how to water your plants or how to situate them correctly for the right amount of light. You can't see the microbes, but they are everywhere, and everything you do in the garden affects them and in turn your plant. As we travel down the road of understanding, you will learn about microbes that plants farm to get more nitrogen. Plants also allow microbes to pollinate flowers so that they end up in seeds to help future generations fight off infection. Special fungi attach themselves to roots to extend the plant's reach in soil, making it easier to find nutrients. Plant available phosphate is a rare resource in soil and microbes collected for plants. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria take nitrogen gas from the air and convert it to a form that plants can use. But did you know that it is the plants that initiate and manage these associations? Plants actively manipulate the microbe community around themselves. Gardeners become obsessed with plant diseases and microbial pathogens are certainly important. What is more surprising to me is that most diseases are preventable, not by direct actions of the gardener, but by the activity of invisible microbes in and on the plant. How many species of living things inhabit Earth? That seems like a simple question, but we still don't know the answer because most species have not yet been identified. We have named about one and a half million of them. There are about 2,000 new native plants discovered every year. There are many spots on Earth that have never been botanized, so that number is certain to grow. The largest gap in our understanding of organisms is with microbes. Their small size and visible similarities make it difficult to identify species. It is only now, with the help of DNA analysis, that we are starting to appreciate their numbers. Armed with new DNA data, Scientists have developed a new estimate of life on Earth that is between 1 and 6 billion species. These results are still quite speculative, but they are changing our understanding of the world. The pie of life charts show how our estimates have changed over time. In 1992, we felt that 73% of the life on Earth consisted of animals and bacteria we're only 4% of that. In 2011, we changed that estimate, and the number of animals increased to 90%. But the most recent study is giving us a completely different picture. We now think that only 7% of life on Earth consists of animals. 78% are bacteria. That is a staggering change from 1992. The world under a microscope. You can't see them or touch them, but microbes exist in vast numbers. It has been suggested that the number of bacteria on Earth is a huge number, 5 million trillion trillion, or 5 times 10 to the 30th. To make it easier to understand this large number, consider just one gram of soil. That is the weight of a single paper clip or the amount of soil under your fingernails after an hour of gardening. The following table 
gives you an idea of some of the microbes in soil and their numbers. One gram of soil can have up to a billion bacteria, a hundred million actinomyces. These are similar to bacteria, 10 million fungi, a million algae, a hundred thousand protozoa, and there's even 10,000 nematodes. Remember, that's in one gram of soil. These numbers are staggering, and yet we can't see them. And because we can't see them, we have trouble appreciating them, and we really don't understand what many of them do. I'd not like to pull out a couple special sections of the book. One is a picture that was taken by Nancy Allen and George Barron uh, here at the University of Guelph. This shows a fungi that is lassoing a nematode. So nematodes are these small eel-like worms. Some of them are so small that we can't see them with just our eyes. But there are fungi who make these round lasso things that trap the nematodes. I think this is one of the most fantastic pictures I have ever seen. Now here's a little story about bees, hellebores, and nectar. Hellebore phytitis, the stinking hellebore, is one of my favorite garden plants for a number of reasons, but especially because it is evergreen in zone 5 and looks good for 12 months of the year. They bloom quite early, even with snow on the ground. By the way, the stink is so mild that you have to rub the plant to detect it. Bumblebees like visiting such early flowers, and we now know that they deposit yeast into the nectar of the flower. Nectar is basically sugar water, which is perfect food for yeast growth. As the yeast grows and multiplies, they generate heat, just like any other organism. And this heat warms the inside of the flower. The increase in nectar temperature, which can be as much as 2 degrees centigrade above ambient, increases the evaporation of volatile organic compounds, and these may help attract pollinators. But there is a downside to this whole process. The yeast uses up sugars to produce the heat, which reduces the amount of sugar in the nectar, making it less appealing to pollinators. The question then becomes, do bees prefer heat over sugar-rich food? They probably prefer heat on cold days and more sugar on warm days. Yeah, bees are fussy just like humans. You might wonder, where do the bees get the yeast? Well, it's found on their bodies and in their stomach. Numerous yeast species are also found on most flowers. Remember, yeast is everywhere. I hope you enjoyed that introduction to the world of microbes. Now, you might have heard about compost tea. I mean, one of the important ingredients in that is the microbes. That's why you're brewing it. Well, if you'd like to know more about compost tea, have a look at this video right here. Happy gardening.